So, who's Rick Albrook? Um, and who's Guide Dogs, maybe? Um, have we got a few Guide Dog owners in the audience today? I know, Mary, you are. Yeah. Any others? No, okay. So, um, I've been asked to do half an hour, and I will keep to my time limits. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I will be here later on, um, after the, uh, I think we've got a four o'clock onwards type session when I can answer questions as well. But I will hang around, so if you want to ask questions, then I'm here to do that. But I want to try and um, bring you up to date with guide dogs. There's lots of things going on that um, perhaps people don't always appreciate what guide dogs can do. Just a bit of background, 85 years, I think it is roughly that guide dogs have been around for now. And um, I suppose the main thing about that is that we've been changing people's lives through guide dogs and um, getting guide dogs to uh, create a partnership, as we call it, to make people mobile and independent. But we can't do that sort of work without um, a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. We've got 12,000 volunteers in guide dogs, and we've got about 1,000 staff. So for every one of me, you've got 12 volunteers in the background doing all sorts of roles, and we simply couldn't do what we do at guide dogs without our volunteers. So my role is slightly different, though. I don't really get involved with dogs. Um, I, my title, is, as Rick Albrook, is a sighted guide ambassador. And you'll be glad to know I'm not using a presentational PowerPoint, so it's just listening to me. Um, but you've got my name on the screen at the back there. I'm a My Guide Ambassador, which sounds very grand. And it sounds like I eat Ferro Rocher chocolates all day long or something like that. But in fact, I'm a trainer. I train people, um, not dogs. And one of the things that um, we, I'll talk about later on is something called My Guide. And it's a quite a new thing that's come out, and I'm hoping that might be of interest to you as a group today. Um, but in terms of guide dogs, we've got 20 mobility teams throughout the country, and I'm based in the Exeter office, so I am southwest based, so apologies to you guys who might be further afield. Um, we are UK based with 20 teams throughout the country. We've got the National Breeding Centre in Leamington, which produces the dogs, if you like, as it would the clues in the title, Breeding Centre, and then we've got a head office at Hillfields as well. But um, guide dogs isn't just about dogs, and I'm going to throw a few questions out to you now, just to keep make sure you're all awake and get your responses. So if I said to you, I don't know why I say if I'm going to say to you, because I'm going to say to you, <laughs> guide dogs is not a dog charity. Does that come as a surprise to anybody? Or... Would you like to tell me what Guide Dogs is, is in terms of a charity? If it's not a dog charity, what do you think Guide Dogs is? Shout out? Yeah. Kind of right, there's lots of charities for the blind. A bit more specific. Ah, fantastic! <laughs> <laughs> so it's a mobility charity. So when we start to look at some numbers, how many people in the country? Well, we've got a very young audience participant over there. So, how many people roughly in the country? Too many. Good answer. Mid-60s, 65 million, something like that. Of which, how many people will have sight loss? Two million. Excellent. So, quite a large number of people will have sight loss. Now, if I start talking to you in terms of guide dogs, how many guide dogs do you think are in the country? So Mary, you've got your guide dog with you today. What's your dog called again? John. John. I should have remembered that, sorry. Slight my So how many Johns do you think there are in the country? Hundred thousand? No? There's about four and a half to five thousand guide dog partnerships in the country. So one of the things that um, Guide Dogs is looking at is, yes, we can do the Guide Dog bit, but as you can see, and there is probably quite a good example of that, there's only one Guide Dog in the room today. So it's limited to how many people we can offer that service to. Does anybody want to guess how much a Guide Dog is worth in terms of how it's running costs for its life? Lady at the back? That is bang on the money. Spot on. Have you been reading my notes? <laughs> 50,000 pounds for a guide dog. So the challenge for guide dogs is we've got waiting lists. And in reality, people are waiting probably a year, 18 months, some people two years for a guide dog. 
but we just can't produce enough dogs for the demand. And as you can tell, for £50,000 is a lot of money that we have to generate. All the money that we use at Guide Dogs is all self-generated. So ultimately, we don't get any funding from other organisations. It's all, all um, produced by our, mainly by our volunteers and often through legacies. So we do have campaigns uh, that Guide Dogs run, one of which would be something like Street Clutter. Does that sound familiar to you? So when you walk down the high street and you see all those um, bikes that are abandoned, um, benches that are in the way, um, waste paper bins or rubbish bin days. So one day the bins are in, the next day they're not. But somebody always forgets to put their bin away, so that's the one you fall over. Um, talking buses, Mary mentioned earlier on. What, and dog attacks is a big thing for us as well. Not a lot of people realise that a lot of guide dogs get attacked and that can uh, destroy a dog from working. So we've got those campaigns going on, but what we're also trying to do is more what we call mobility work. So mobility work, or a guide dog is a mobility aid, includes white cane training for instance, and um, there's a lot of things around mobility training that people can learn as techniques to get out around and about. Like Mary was saying, some people say, I can't do that, I've lost my sight and I'm never going to be able to do that again. Well, that's not always true, but sometimes you have to show people the trade secrets, if you like, as to how we do that. And I think my view is that we've probably been a little bit good at guide dogs at keeping our secrets, uh, sorry, trade secrets secret. One of those trade secrets really is my guide. So my guide is a project, or is now a service, but was a project that looks at getting people out and about by uh, recruiting volunteers to help people get out of their homes. Could be to go for a cup of coffee, could be go to go to church. Um, so we're looking for volunteers to be able to help with that type of um, service. Often, it's quite difficult to get that up and running because having the right person or the right volunteer in the right place at the right time for the person who needs the help is a logistical uh, nightmare sometimes, but it does work for, for people who need it. The other side of my guide is we do um, nationally accredited my guide training. So it's called level one training, which is about sighted guiding. So a lot of the work I would be doing here in the Southwest includes local charities and societies, bus operators, so stagecoach, uh, first bus, extra airport, Cardiff airport, um, uh, the libraries, volunteer groups I mentioned before, First Great Western, their passenger assistance staff, um, the Olympics we had a while ago and we trained, I think it's just over 2,000 my guide volunteers to the Olympics as well. So the other side that I'm looking at is hospitals because I'm going to just throw a question out to you guys as well, is that sometimes when you go to hospitals, it's interesting to watch what happens with you being um, guided in hospitals. Would that sound familiar? No? You're lucky if you get guided. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what I'm getting at is phrases being used like if, you've, if you're waiting for your appointment, somebody shouting out, is Mrs. Jones here? and they stand with a, a clipboard and Mrs Jones doesn't know she's been talked to. She might be hearing impaired as well for all we know. Or the classic that I've seen several times is um, those of you with a yellow card, which could be your emergency card for your appointment for you know, to go and see the consultant, um, would you like to follow me? <laughs> I'm walking off from the mic now, but is that, that's what it's like. So a lot of my work is also getting into all the hospitals in the South West to try and make sure the eye clinics have access to this sort of training. So, um, the other side of uh, training also approaches access issues. So we do have regular uh, occurrences where guide dogs are refused access. And Mary, could you give me an example? I'm picking on you now, Mary, because you're the only guide dog owner that I can see. But it helps to understand some of the issues that you face when accessing buildings, maybe, or restaurants. Um, the restaurants can get it turned away um, from, from restaurants sometimes, displays the disease or tries to. Um, taxis. Um, yeah. And, uh, Taxi drivers refusing to take the dog in the car. Yeah. And whilst a lot of people. Have, you know, there are some that have a health card, but 
Yeah. So there's a lot of work around access issues that goes on as well. And at the mo in, in the past, guide dogs have only really been able to say the law is the law, a guide dog is allowed to go more or less anywhere um, and kind of wrap people's knuckles and make a complaint. But now what we're seeing more and more of now is people want training. Because the reality is out there that people with um, sight loss aren't understood. And a lot of you around here probably don't look visually impaired for, for a lot of people to understand that you've got a sight impairment. So part of the deal is that you have to ask for assistance. That's you know, kind of how it is. But also the important thing is when you do ask for assistance is you get offered assistance in the right way. And the level one guide, my guide program is looking at making sure that people who need to have access to training are aware of the sighted guide sighted guiding techniques. So, um, have you heard of Action for Blind People? Okay. Action for Blind People are running courses called Living with Sight Loss. And Mary's um, case study, and she was talking about all the issues she was going through. A lot of that is what the Living with Sight Loss courses are about in Action for Blind People. So what we're looking at doing is trying to work collaboratively, co can't say that word, collaboratively with Action for Blind People because what's coming across from it is that people who attend those courses who are visually impaired don't necessarily get taught how to be guided. So on one hand you've got 65 million people in the country who are sighted and I can try and chase around all those people and train them all on how to guide people which is great and there are strategic objectives to do with that and make sure we get to the right people but actually visually impaired people themselves need to know how to be guided. So I just want to have a little straw poll because all of the stuff that Rick does at the moment is pretty unscientific. It's just going along with what people say on courses to me. If I could just ask anybody in the room here, who, who, how many people here have actually been taught how to be guided? <coughs> so I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, probably say ten people in the room. And do you mind me asking how you found out that guiding technique? Mary, you probably did it through guide dogs, I guess. No. No? Ooh, right. I helped write the RNI book, the guide book. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And the other people, do you want to just shout out how you found out about guiding? Oh, okay. Yep. Right, so how, sorry, how long ago was that? Okay, so it's, can, can you see where I'm coming from? There's a lot of people who would probably benefit from sighted guide training. So whilst guide dogs are doing the guide dogs with a dog, we also can help you with your mobility as well. So what I want you to think about today is whether or not that would be something that would be of interest to you. There's 20 people like me in the country so there's 20 My Guide ambassadors in the country, one for each team. And what I'm looking at doing is running sessions for people who are interested with their partners, preferably with their sighted partner, carer, brother, sister, next door neighbour, whatever it might be as well, to explain the techniques of guiding. Because there's a definite right way and a wrong way of guiding. Sorry, speak. Okay, so I'm adult based. I'll come to the children's bit in a moment because there are some changes with that coming up as well for guide dogs. So, are you asking for children in particular? Is that what you're. Yeah, okay. Okay, we'll come to that in a second. I am not um, trained to um, uh, deal with children. I've had two of my own and it scared me off stiff. So. <laughs> but no. So, um, guiding adults is what we're talking about. So what comes across is that a lot of people with sight loss are having, um, they don't get trained, you know, if you lose your sight or if you've never had sight, you don't necessarily get trained in how to be guided. And as the lady over to my left was just saying, how many years ago that was produced at Action? Uh, yeah, and would you say that guiding technique is anything new then? As it, was it a new concept? Yeah. So it was called to um, teach the 
Yeah. Okay. So the techniques that were taught then, though, were, have been around for donkeys years. Yeah. yeah. Is that true to say you, you, the, the techniques well, that you wrote? Yeah. It's not changed, I can assure you. It's, it's, it's not rocket science, is what I'm trying to say. It's not technical. There are a few rules of guiding, but ultimately it's all about being person centred and guiding the person how they want to be guided. But what happens too often is that people get dragged around, and I'm going to grab a victim now. Sorry. So I've got, I've got James now. And James. Typically what happens is someone takes your hand and off you go. You're walking off, you're walking right across to the side of the room. But they've all forgotten to ask that person, are you James? What does he need? Mm-hmm. Or where does he want to go? Because he doesn't want to cross the road, he doesn't want to cross the road, he wants to just catch that bus. Mm-hmm. And so, James, just hang on a second. So what I'm going to do is do it down as an example. This is just to get you thinking about dying. Is I need to ask James first of all what he wants. So if it's tap on the shoulder, James, hi James, I'm Ruth, you need some help. He might say to me, bog off. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, he might just say, and it's really dangerous asking people, especially um, people with disabilities, what they might want, because what might happen if you ask a person what they, what they need? They might just tell you. Okay. And you'll be amazed at how many people in the in public environment are scared of offering assistance to people who are visually impaired. So what it would be, hi James, I'm Rick, stop your uh, hand on your elbow, link arms and off we go. That's, that's as easy as it is. It really is. But we need to be talked through. The other thing that happens, and I see this in hospitals a lot, and the people who were saying that they um, had various experiences, does this sound familiar? So James, I've got a seat for you over here. Um, I know you've had your eyes dilated, and I know you've been through a traumatic experience or anything, but I'm going to pump you in this chair over here. So you just go to your right, 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 left, 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 back, 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 back. bang. <laughs> <laughs> does, does that sound familiar? <laughs> Sorry, I've gone off mics now. <laughs> I'm a bit random. So what, what you need to do, James, just to borrow you again, is for James to just... Uh, just walk. But let's pretend we're going this way. So James Walk says he's forgotten his wallet now, so we need to change direction to just come towards the same place we came. In return, we change direction, that's spinning that person around. James, there's a seat here in front of you. I've got my guiding hand on the, on the chair. There's the chair. So that's just a very, very quick example of how you should guide somebody to make sure they don't fall off a chair. But that's the kind of thing that my guide's about. So whilst we're still doing the, the guide dog package, and we're, 70 or 80 percent of what we do will always be guide dogs, and the vast amount of money that we spend will be guide dogs. But we've got a small budget that we can run my guide through. So that means 20 people like me—they're not all as glamorous as me, as you can probably tell—they <laughs> um, are all throughout the country. So. It's just a suggestion that maybe, as an organisation, it's something that might be of interest to you. I'm quite happy to run sessions in the South West. I was talking to Heather earlier on, is it, who was organising the day. She said there are groups of you to get together, so maybe we could do a session like that and then see where that takes us. Um, but it's an important skill because, like Mary was saying, Mary, you fell over, you were saying, just last month, was it? Yeah. And I, I probably wasn't being guided, but I bet you can name a few instances where you've been guided really badly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it kind of helps. Especially help- when people push you from behind because they can't see through me. I'm quite big. Yeah. The, the classic is push. You sh- so one of the rules of guiding is you should always guide from in front. Always guide from in front. And if you don't do that, what you're effectively doing, Mary, can I manhandle you? Yes. <laughs> I'm so used to it. <laughs> oh, I promise I'll do it safely. So, so we've got Mary here. And what Mary's talking about, just come to the left bit because that light is dazzling me. <laughs> so Mary's here, and what she's talking about is being pushed in front. So what is it? What I'm actually going to be saying to Mary now is all yeah. Is Mary, if you go in front 
from me, walk in front of me, and I'll tell you what, if you look past me over that chair, I'll stand back and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're saying to somebody if you're not biting them from the chair. Mary, I don't know what she's got there. A nice secret, Mary. We talk about that another time. Mary is just going to follow me. I can guide her. We've even got a narrow space where we've got a projector. So this is yeah. got my hand in. Yeah. Uh, so. no, I'm just going to quickly want to chair. So the back of the chair is. Yeah. 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 I can sit myself down then. I can turn myself around with dignity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and dignity is the key word. Because who was the last person you grabbed like I grabbed James and dragged him across the other side of the room? Children. <laughs> yeah, so dignity is a key word. Right. Come on, and people. also fear, because if you push me ahead, it's very frightening being pushed back right into the unknown. If I'm following you by holding your arm, I, ha- I can be much more relaxed about it. Yeah. Because I know you're going to meet the hazards first. Yeah, so, so Mary has lost her sight, or has no sight, not her brains. So all I'm acting as is the eyes for Mary and telling her where the hazards are, where to slow down, where to stop, where the stairs go up or stairs go down, which is funnily enough, when you think about it, who else does that? A guide dog. So the techniques are very similar to what a guide dog would use. So can you see where I'm coming from with that? Is that does that sort of explain my guide a bit? Lots of different ways of doing my guide, and different parts of the country are doing it in different ways according to what works, and that's ironically quite a good way of doing it because that's really what people want. The other thing I was asking, being asked about was children. So I'm not an expert on children, um, especially as I'm a father, so that's <laughs> not necessarily a qualification. But um, I don't know if you realise that guide dogs really in the past have always been adult based. So they've offered uh, guide dogs to um, 18 plus. But recently, the National Children's Blind Society, I think is the right phrase, um, has been amalgamated or taken or run by guide dogs now. And it's called Children, Blind Children UK. So for the people in the room with children, there's something to think about with that, because that's quite, that's new. That's happened in the last 12 months. And um, I'm told, statistically, 30,000 children in the country with sight loss. Does that sound about right? Um, but 1,400 are being supported through, um, that, through that side of guide dogs, ultimately having taken over all the running of the charity. So we've got children's mobility instructors, and we're taking on more, I believe, as um, we go forward. But certainly we've got somebody in the southwest called Tracy James, and she's a children's mobility instructor. Now, it's a different proposition because giving a child a guide dog isn't necessarily going to work. It can work. Um, but a lot of children are more interested in what I would call confidence and being able to um, access education, just like Mary was talking about. And um, the idea is that the children have an assessment and then they would look at their needs with the educational background, assisted technology, adaptations, supporting the teacher, whatever the curriculum um, is, is demanding of the child. So that's a new part for guide dogs and something to think about for, um, for, for children's services. The other side of it is we um, also do buddy dogs. So buddy dogs are dogs, guide dogs that haven't quite made the grade. They don't all, they're not all perfect by any means. And if the guide dog isn't suitable, having done its training to qualify, it may well then become a, a buddy dog for a child and if you go to school with a dog, a well-trained dog, you might not be, you might be isolated. Mary, you would, sorry, I'm going to pick on you again, Mary, but you're talking about school and being quite difficult, maybe in some situations being isolated. Is that the sort of, yeah. in, in people not knowing what you need? But if you put a dog with a person who goes to a child who goes to school, certainly they'll be everybody's best mate. So that's kind of some of the... true with adults. Yes. People that come and talk to you because you've got a dog, and then you've got interactions going on. Yes. Where you, people just don't look at. Yeah. They don't tend to always be quite so approachable with white canes. They're not quite such an interesting conversation to me. No. No, not quite so demanding. <laughs> but but it's, it's a new thing for guide dogs. So the, the uh, Blind Children UK stuff on the website about all of this so for guide dogs. So if you want to find more information, there's loads of information on the, on, on the website. Um, that's about me done. So, I've got five minutes apparently, so has anybody got any questions you want to ask me? No.
No questions? Well, I, did, I did that training. Oh, right. About three weeks ago. Was it with me? And it was really, really interesting. Okay. And uh, somebody else was doing it. It was a guide, and a guide for herself. Yeah. And uh, she was actually guiding me, which was quite an experience. Um, but she said, nobody's ever shown me how I should be guided. No. Because it's so useful. Yeah. We, we kind of overlook it because this is what happens living with sight loss course basically I was faced with um, I think 12 people in a group and I'm thinking you know none of these people are interested in the guide dog actually it's either too early or it's just something you haven't thought about so we started talking about um, what do you find a real challenge and it started off talking about being in the hospital and being bumped into doors and pushed and rather than guided and then um, a couple of people in the group were cited, uh, I think they were partly a husband, wife, and one was a carer. And they said, actually, I don't know really what I'm supposed to be doing. And we just muddle along. So that's how it's all started. So, so are you talking from a sighted person's point of view? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So from a sighted... It's morning course, And it's not rocket science, otherwise I'm going to teach it. <laughs> Sorry, questions at the front. Well, cast... Uh, well, we can charge people if we want to. I mean, typically, this is where it gets a little bit, um, um, how can we say, we, we wouldn't charge you as an organisation because you're in the sight loss sector and you're a charity. So the whole point of it is to get across to that audience. Um, but there are organisations, for instance, um, Stagecoach, commercial organisation, we said to them, well, you know, we're giving you good training package here. And they paid for that as a commercial training agreement. So it depends. Um, the main purpose isn't to earn money out of it, though. The main purpose is to get the message across about sign loss. So if you talk well, about... I think if we learn... Sorry, if, we, if we learn, when people help us, we can help... We can almost go to training and support them so we, we're, we're assisted in, in a comfortable, safe way. Yeah, because this is the other thing that came out of the Living with Sight Loss course, is that people who are visually impaired, especially if you've been recently diagnosed, they're seen as demanding, don't know what they want, don't know where they want to go type of thing. So what Mary's um, highlighting, and it's one thing I'm absolutely passionate about, is sighted people cannot understand sight loss unless they do a blindfold walk. At the same time, visually impaired people don't necessarily don't know what they don't know until somebody tells them what they don't know. So if you're having a bad guiding experience, you can say something like, like I was with James, you can say, stop, 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 stop. I'm, you're scaring me. Hands off. But what do you do after that? Because you don't know what you're, what's safe or what, what the good way of doing it is. So if, if you can then say, can you just stand still for a minute? Don't push me. Let me take your elbow and just tell me when you get to obstacles and, when, and, where, and what the obstacles are. And you can set your own standards. So the other thing I'm passionate about, I'm passionate about getting people in blindfolds. I love doing that because you should see the chaos that reigns. <laughs> and the other thing I'm passionate about is visually impaired people being able to set their own standards as to how they should be guided and asking for the help in the right way. I'm probably out of time. I was going to say, uh, half the time we find ourselves having to guide each other. Yeah. It's just like you, the, the most sighted person, and you do it for the others. <laughs> well, that's what I call the conga. You, you're talking about, yeah? So when I do the training, I have uh, three concepts. One is the conga, which is how to guide people with your hand on your shoulder. It could be ten people going to the ladies, whatever it is. The person with the best sight at the front. Uh, the other one is your chicken wings. So you should always keep your chicken wings in. So when you're guiding someone, they can feel your body move. Yeah. And the other one is poly parrot or parrot, you know, how you guide someone on your shoulder. So it, it's kind of fun disability training, if you like, but it's not as good as dishwater. And like James says, um, I can, there's lots of things that visually impaired people can pick up from it. Um, and a good example is that one, is that the fire brigade, I did some work with the fire brigade and the police services, and they just stopped me in the middle of the session when we were doing the hands on shoulders with 10 people doing the conga, and they said, oh my God, we've just realised that's the way you get somebody out of the building. So fire. <laughs> yeah. So Mary, if, if there's fire now, and it's smoke forward environment, guess who I'm going to get hold of? I'm going to get hold of Mary. Yeah. Or maybe John. Maybe John. <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff that comes out of it, James. So yeah.
Anyway, that's me done. Coffee break. I'm Miranda. Got any questions? Thank you.